Good afternoon. Welcome to this episode of Safe and Sound Somerset's Live at Lunch, opening the doors to safety through housing for domestic violence survivors. My name is Joelle Piercy. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator here, and I'm here with Tanya Mack, Safe and Sound Somerset's Financial Empowerment Coordinator. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you, Joelle. Thank you for having me today. Mm -hmm, of course. So in the, in the middle of the pandemic, Safe and Sound Somerset launched the Domestic Violence Housing First Initiative. Um, I've invited Tanya today to come and um, because she leads the program to come talk with us and tell us more about this new initiative as well as the success we've seen from it. So are you ready to get started, Tanya? I am. I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you please start us out with just, just a quick overview of what the Domestic Violence Housing First Initiative is? Absolutely. So the Domestic Violence Housing First Initiative um, is an initiative that helps survivors get into safe housing quickly. And when I say safe housing, it's safe independent housing quickly so they can focus on their trauma-informed services um, that will allow them to rebuild them their lives in a comfortable environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You talk about partnership with the survivors. What does that partnership look like? Ooh, that partnership looks like um, in various areas. It could look like us providing financial resources for them, um, providing a supportive ear, also helping them advocate, um, and then also encouraging them to use their voice. Um, we partner with them just so they know that they're not alone within this program, in this initiative. When you say advocate, what does that mean to the Domestic Violence Housing First Initiative? What are they advocating for? Oh, okay, so that's also another good question. So one of the things or one of the challenges survivors face when they're deciding to leave um, their situation, you know, their situation is they have barriers. And some mm -hmm. of the barriers may look like um, their credit score, uh, lack of job um, history. So we are helping them use their voice to advocate, okay, this is the reason why I'm in this situation. And when they're speaking to property owners and landlords, and this is why I need safe housing. This is why I would like for you to consider me um, so I can focus on rebuilding my life for myself as well as my children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can imagine for this initiative, it's really important that, that as an organization, as, as for you um, leading this initiative, that it really takes a lot of relationship building with the community to help establish those connections. Oh, yes, that is actually part of that initiative. And that is called the community engagement. That's part of the four pillars of the Domestic Violence Housing First Initiative. And as going out into the community, whether, and what I mean by going out is either picking up the phone, making that face-to-face -face contact with uh, other community service providers, the landlords explaining how this program or this initiative benefits survivors of domestic violence. And so they're not alone. And then when survivors um, find this safe independent housing, the property owners and the landlords, they have information as well on how to deal with situations that may arise or be a little bit more flexible if the survivor is having challenges when they move into the location. So that a community engagement piece, Joelle, is mm -hmm. extremely important as part of this um, initiative. Yeah, it sounds like it. You mentioned four pillars and community yes. engagement is one. Can you talk briefly about the other three pillars? Oh, absolutely. The other one is mobile advocacy. Now that we're transitioning out of the pandemic, we can actually focus on the mobile advocacy. And the mobile advocacy is meeting the survivors where they are. So say if they mm -hmm. lack transportation, we can go meet them in a park. We can go to Starbucks. We can go to a library. We can help them face-to-face -face in person if they feel safe, um, you know, with everything consider considered. Uh, and just meeting them where they are to talk about what we can do, how we can partner with them. Um, the third one is flexible funding, and that's mm -hmm. if, if a survivor needs assistance moving into their location, okay, and um, they need financial support. They need financial support to go on a job interview, or if their car um, is not working and they need to get to the 
job interview, we can help them with that. So that's the flexible funding piece. And then the fourth piece is just the overall advocacy, what we talked about, the partnership, providing the supportive um, listening to them. So those are the four pillars. It sounds like a really holistic approach to housing, mm -hmm. yes. right? That's perfect. That's a perfect way to describe that. Mm -hmm. There's so many different facets that goes that really go into somebody finding safe, stable, sustainable housing. Yes, and it's continuous too. Mm -hmm. It's it's continuous once they find the independent housing or get into the independent housing. Um, this service is designed to be continuous so they can be successful, so they can you know move forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So continuing to provide services and support even after they get into uh, an apartment or house. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about those words housing first, because um, there's actually a whole history um, behind those words housing first in the social mm -hmm. services, and there's theories behind that those words. Can you tell us a, just a little bit more about what housing first really means? Absolutely. So I just want to start off, for, if I can, um, the National Alliance of Homelessness um, released a, a statistic that 60% of women and children become, face immediate homelessness due to domestic violence. Wow. So the theory behind the Housing First um, initiative or the Housing First is that it takes a homelessness assistance approach. And what I mean by that is helping those who may have become homeless, or I'm going to say houseless or unhoused, um, due to whatever situations that they're in, getting them into permanent housing. So they can start working on the counseling services. They can find jobs. Um, if they want to build their education, they have a place now to study. They have a place to rest their head. So that is the, I would say, the theory behind the housing first. Um, helping those get into safe housing so they can focus on all the other needs, um, the rest, the uh, warmth, the security, and so they can build the confidence in, within themselves. Yeah, it seems like just a small change in the way you think about it, but really it has huge a huge effect, right? Yes, overall long-term effect. Um, because this initiative is not designed to be short term. It is designed to be long term. That's what we have in mind when we partner with the survivors. How is this initiative going to help you four or five years from now? And one of the things I want to tell you, Joelle, what I see when I'm working with the survivors um, long term, once mm -hmm. they get independent housing, can you imagine now I can register for school? Mm -hmm. I can secure an education that's going to help me 10, 15 years down the line. And now my children see an example of what I can do and what I can overcome. It has long-term positive ramifications, this initiative, um, in so many ways, economically. Um, you know, sometimes it breaks a generational curse of poverty. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of things. Absolutely. And it's so different from, you know, I feel like in society, we housing is kind of like what you get as, as a reward for doing other things right. But the reality yeah. is you can't do those other things without that safe housing. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You cannot. Especially mm -hmm. where you're going to rest your head. Right. Absolutely. That's what an exciting initiative um, to be able to have put in place. Yes, I absolutely love this initiative. Um, and the reason why I love the initiative because it actually takes, hmm, it takes the decision-making from the advocate and empowers the survivor to use their voice. And then once they're using their voice and they accomplish whatever mid short, midterm or long-term goal that they have, they can say, this is something that I accomplished. Mm -hmm. You can take their self-esteem from here up to here. That's just so awesome. It sounds like it sounds like that's a real success or benefit of the program. Oh, absolutely. And, and there's many. <laughs> so yes. 
figure, and there's many benefits. And then, you know, if I can just take a moment to share some of the benefits um, that this initiative brings to survivors, as I mentioned, the self-confidence, um, the economic uh, growth that they can receive from receiving um, safe housing. Third, also, I think, especially parents or mothers or fathers, because this is designed for everyone, um, show of the children what they can do mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. absolutely um how has how has this initiative changed how safe and sound somerset supports domestic abuse survivors with housing so how has um it changed is the financial resources prior to um this initiative being placed under the financial empowerment program Yes, we were doing the work, we were helping the survivors with money management, but the missing piece was the housing. Okay, mm -hmm. doing this and you know, survivors are coming, I don't know where I'm gonna go. I don't know how I'm going to leave. And we know that often survivors will not leave a relationship or an abusive relationship if they have no place to go. If they mm -hmm. don't, they're gonna put food on the table where they're going to sleep. So with this new initiative added onto the program, um, this has been a game changer. Mm -hmm. So it still is a pretty new program, just, just over a year old, I believe, right? Uh, yes, a little under yeah. a year. Yes, uh -huh. a little under a year. Um, September 20, between mm -hmm. August and September 2020. So um, with that time, I also want to share, because I think this is really important to know. So when we first launched this initiative, we um, help four survivors um, get into safe, independent housing. Over time, as this program, the initiative continued to evolve, um, Joelle, I have to tell you, so we help survivors with relocation, with furniture. We help them um, go into their safe housing. So instead of four, now we're going up to eight families that have gone into um, safe housing. And so as this uh, program continues to grow and continues to expand, we want to see more survivors secure independent housing. That is the overall goal of this program. More survivors securing independent housing, more survivors um, managing their finances, creating um, emergency housing funds. So therefore, if they get into a situation where you know, they're stuck again. Okay, you know what? From this program, I learned I need to have a housing fund. So that's how we see this. Pro it's like a continuous learning um, initiative. That's what I could tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does someone access this great service? So great thing is there's many ways um, that survivors can access our service. So first and foremost is our 24-hour um, hotline, text line, which is the entryway to our agency for all of our programs. But then also with the community partners that we're established through the community engagement pillar, um, referrals from them. So there are so many ways that survivors can access us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you to conclude with one, just kind of a one last thought. Uh, yeah. If there's if there's someone who's watching who is scared to leave in an abusive situation, which mm -hmm. is what you said might happen if they're not really sure what where they might go next, mm -hmm. what would you say to them right now? Oh, wow. That's a great question, Joelle. So first and foremost, what I would say to them, I would say, I hope the information that I shared with you today gives them the courage enough to know that they have support available to them, not just eight hours a day, that support is available to them 24 hours, seven days a week. So therefore, they can find time to pick up the phone and give us a call and say, I need help. Even if that help comes in the form, I just need someone to listen to. Or if that help comes into the form and say, we can refer you to a program that has an initiative that is designed to help you get into safe, independent housing. We want them to know there is support out there and, um, and you know, to use their voice to, voice to call, contact us, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those kind and compassionate words. 
Uh, I want to thank you so much for being here, Tanya. This has been just a really informative, but also I feel like really thoughtful discussion about just about the importance of housing to the healing of survivors and about this great new initiative. So thank you so much again. Thank you, Joelle, so much for having me. It was a pleasure having this conversation mm -hmm. about the initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are listening, uh, please know that you deserve safety. As Tanya says, you deserve a safe place to rest your head. If you or someone you know is experiencing abuse and needs help, call or text our hotline 24-7 at 866-685-1122. You can also visit our website, www.safe-sound.org for more information and safety planning tools. Thank you so much for being here with us and have a great afternoon. Thank you.